thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Stephen Goynell with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I'm the director of the Office of Agricultural War Policy. And what I'm going to talk to you about for the few minutes I've got, and then we'll be obviously again with some questions and answers, is what our program's set up to do and what we're currently doing and kind of where we're headed. Um, our office um, job is to work on the issues of water quantity and water quality uh, relative to agriculture. We have some specific statutory responsibilities in that. Uh, we partner with uh, FDEP and the water management districts to implement uh, the programs that affect agriculture. Whenever uh, any of those entities, the DEP or water management district, has a program that involves agriculture, they usually come to us. We have staff that work with them on that. We're specifically responsible for developing the, the best management practices, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, that to protect water quantity and water quality uh, to be implemented by agriculture. We work with DEP to validate those. We adopt them by rule. Uh, and then we work with the ag producers and the water management districts. Uh, they also have programs like this to implement those best management practices. So we're not out there by ourselves. We're working with a lot of partners. Um, we also work with DEP. Tom talked about the BMAT process. We work uh, directly with DEP on, in that process in terms of uh, when they set the allocations for agriculture, we're in there with them, uh, working with them to make sure that the data they're using is, is good data. Um, and we work on achieving the goals for the BMATs. To achieve those goals, we have to do three things. Um, if Tom did a real good job explaining what the process is setting them, well, once the goals are set, and we're, we know what we're trying to do when we're dealing with an allocation for agriculture, uh, what do we do? Well, first of all, we have to have the appropriate best management practices in place to address the water quality issues, whatever they happen to be, whether it's phosphorus down, mostly it's phosphorus in South Florida and nitrates from the springs. And we have to ensure that they get implemented. We have a program for that. <coughs> but we expect, and the, the information that we have shows that the best management practices by themselves will not meet the goals for the BMAP. At least that's what we expect. So we know we have to do something else also. And uh, Tom talked about some of the things that some of the BMAP, uh, BMAPs are doing to meet the TNBLs within the BMAP. Agriculture is going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to do something beyond the BMPs to meet the total DMDL for the uh, for the BMAP. And we'll talk about that, how we're doing that. So first, just a little bit about the BMPs. Uh, we have developed, along with IFAS and the ag community and DEP, a set of BMPs for nine different types of agricultural production. We have them for cow-calf production, sod production, especially fruit and nut, equine, citrus, nursery, vegetable, and agronomic crops, dairies, and poultry. Uh, they're all available on our website. Uh, there's a lot of information on our website. You just go to the Office of Agriculture Policy, and we've got tons of information there. You can see all the BMPs. You can see the manuals. You can download the manuals. You can see the maps of enrollment. Uh, the, the question that came up before about agricultural water demand, uh, we have a process where we annually produce a report on agri projected agricultural water demand and provide that information to our management district. That report's on there on the website. All that's out there. Um, the BMPs themselves, uh, there's, there's around 950 separate practices that are included in those manuals I told you about. Um, for screens in particular, the ones that are most important are practices that maximize the efficient use of fertilizer and water. And I'm just going to briefly describe a couple of them to you. Um, the, the basis of efficient nutrient management in, in spring sheds is uh, testing the soil to determine the need for any particular nutrient amendment that's needed to produce a crop. And it's best to do that at the subfield level. The traditional uh, method of doing soil testing and, and uh, fertilizing, developing fertilizer recommendations to do it sort of at a field unit level. What we're moving to, and what agriculture is moving to, is doing it at the subfield level. In some cases, down to, you know, you have 100 samples in the field, that kind of level of, of, of uh, precision. And then that gets coupled with a precision application of fertilizer and lime materials and also water. We talk about that. We have uh, systems that we're developing that uh, producers are 
uh, I, I shouldn't say we're developing, that are, have been developed and that we're helping producers implement that are actually uh, apply variable rates of water in specific areas of the field depending on the particular water needs in that particular in the field. The area of the field could be as small as you know, 10 meters by 10 meters, that kind of thing. So it's very, you know, precision application of water as opposed to uh, just a field level. Um, other things that we're doing, you saw some of the slides that uh, some of the other speakers, Daryl, showed some slides of the soil moisture meters. We have uh, a lot of effort now to get uh, producers to implement, uh, to use uh, soil moisture meters that actually measure the soil moisture content in the root zone and provide information real time to the producer how, what the soil moisture content is in the root zone so they can adjust the irrigation just the amount that's needed for the production of plants so they don't have water leaching out of the root zone which carries fertilizer with it. Uh, we have weather station programs where we uh, help them in, uh, install weather stations that then in turn can be uh, tied to other information systems that they use to manage irrigation so that they Again, only apply the amount of irrigation they use, and then automated irrigation controllers. And there, so, a lot of uh, separate technologies and practices that we're we've worked with the ag community and the universities and other agencies to develop these and implement these. The way we do it is we start by enrolling, identifying the ag producer in an area. We work with the ag producer to enroll in our program. Um, our field staff does that. Uh, once they're enrolled, then we work with them to determine which best management practices are most suited to their operation. Uh, right now, we have about half of the ag acres statewide enrolled in our program. So we've got a ways to go, we've got another half to do. When it comes to spring sheds, uh, we have less than half. We have, between, depending on the spring shed, between 4 and 60% of the spring shed enrolled overall, of all the spring shed acres that are in ag, about 23% of them are currently enrolled. So we have a long way to go um, to do that. The legislature, um, like Tom said before, the legislature has made an investment in this program. They recently gave us some new positions and uh, some more funding. So we're in the process of, of focusing on that. We had about 750 enrollments a year in our program. Once they're enrolled, we follow up with what's called an implementation assurance program. And the purpose of that is to, uh, you know, basically make sure they implement the BPs that have been identified. Uh, that area, as a result of the 2016 legislation, is changing. It's becoming more of a, the current program does a, about between, around 20% of the enrollees each year are, are, are engaged in the implementation assurance program. We're going to change that to under the new system to 100% uh, engagement. Most of that will be an online survey that they'll fill out, just a document that they're they're continuing to uh, implement the entities that have been identified with some follow-ups. And of course, if they don't engage in the online survey, that that'll trigger some kind of follow-up to make sure they're still they're still working. So we're going to have a lot higher percentage of uh, implementation assurance. We also conduct cost share programs in which we work with the ag producers to implement the, the best management practices. For example, if it's a soil moisture meter, we pay for a percentage of the cost of that and the cost of the service to maintain it for a period of time until they've adopted it and they're used to using it and they don't really lose it anymore. And similar to programs that the water management system are talking about with cost share programs. I've talked about the fact that we also need projects to meet the BMAP goals. Some of the projects that we're um, working on, along with the water management districts and the, and the, the um, Daryl Smith showed you the denitrification treatment basins. That's a project we've been working on. We've helped fund the, the research on it. There are projects to evaluate the reuse of water on farm so that water that um, may have high levels of nitrate is pumped back onto the field instead of, um, or pumped to another field so it doesn't leach. 
Um, rotational production is one that we're real interested in and uh, other water management districts are interested in too that we've been working on a rotational. The idea of rotational production is to set up a system in which uh, out of a four year period, two of the years are in grass production, which I think Darrell mentioned already, reduces your water use, reduces your fertilizer use, improves the soil structure. Uh, IFAS has been doing research on this for 15 years now over in Quincy. They've got a lot of data to show the benefits of it. We were asking for funding this next fiscal year to uh, expand or to start an incentive program to get um, ag producers in some specific spring sheds to adopt this practice. The difficulty in doing it is that it's a, it's a pretty fundamental shift in the ag practices for the farmer. Most farmers uh, will time the, or, or select the crop they're going to produce based on the projected prices of the crop the next year. So if peanut prices are higher, they're going to plant peanuts. If cotton prices are projected higher, they'll plant cotton, that kind of thing. Because after all, agriculture is an economic enterprise and they need to survive economically. And so they're going to go for the best crop uh, to do that. The advantage of the rotational production is it sort of takes them off that cycle a little bit by building in a two-year period where they uh, have other means of income, which would be something I run out of time. Okay. 